Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Marcus Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question number one, please, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Minister! Mr Speaker, today marks two years since the terror attack on the Finsbury Park Mosque. It was a truly cowardly and depraved attack that was intended to divide us. Instead, London remained united. And it is London's diverse communities that make London the world's greatest capital city. Mr Speaker, in recent days and weeks, we've seen flooding across the country, which has been particularly severe in Lincolnshire. I know the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to the work of the emergency services, our military, the Environment Agency and all those who have been working on the ground to support the communities affected. The Government stands ready to respond and offer all assistance where required. Mr Speaker, this morning I have meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Marcus Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I would like to associate myself and the whole House with the comments the Prime Minister has made about the Finsbury Park mosque attack uh, and the flooding uh, in Lincolnshire. Uh, Mr Speaker, if our town centres are to survive and thrive, we need more people living in them more people working in them and more people spending their leisure time in them. I welcome the Future High Streets Fund and would commend to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, the bid that's been put in, the important bid, from the Neaton, uh, and would ask her if she could speak to her ministers to look on that bid very favourably. Prime Minister! Well, can I say, my, right hon- my honourable friend is right to say that uh, high streets are changing and we're committed. we are committed to helping communities adapt, and he set out some of the things he wants to see if we're going to see those high streets continue to thrive. And of course, as he said, we've provided £675 million in the Future High Streets Fund. I'm pleased to hear about the Transforming Nuneaton uh, programme. I understand this aims to increase footfall and drive economic growth. And the bid from Nuneaton for the uh, High Streets Fund is currently under consideration, and we hope to announce the bids that have been successful in going forward to the business case development phase in the summer. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today does mark two years since the terrorist attack on Muslim people in Finsbury Park outside the mosque and the murder of my constituent, Makram Ali. With the far right on the rise both in our country and across the world, we can all send a message to all those who seek to sow hatred and division in our society that we will not be divided. Our diversity is our strength and I believe always will be. And I concur with what the Prime Minister said about the need to support people who have suffered from the floods over the weekend and of course the work of the emergency services in helping them. On Friday, I was honoured, Mr Speaker, to join Grenfell residents and survivors to mark the two-year anniversary of that terrible tragedy. With great dignity, they are also campaigning for justice and change. Across this House, we have a duty to make sure such fires can never happen again. That's why I've signed up to, and I hope the Prime Minister will, the Never Again campaign run by the Fire Brigade Union with the support of the Daily Mirror. Three years after the Grenfell fire, the Prime Minister said, my government will do whatever it takes to help those affected get justice and keep our people safe. So two years on, why do 328 high-rise buildings, homes to thousands of people from Newham to Newcastle, still have the same Grenfell-style cladding? Prime Minister. I first of all, say to the right honourable gentleman that I absolutely agree with him that we will never be divided and our diversity is indeed our strength and we should all celebrate that diversity. He refers to uh, last Friday being two years on from the terrible tragedy of the Grenfell fire. I was very pleased yesterday to uh, welcome, as part of Green for Grenfell, uh, people from the Grenfell community, Grenfell United and others, to uh, Number 10 Downing Street, particularly young people, and to hear from them their questions and talk to them about their concerns for the future. He refers to the issue of cladding on uh, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. I'm I'm pleased to see her back from her re-education camp of a few weeks ago. Um, She says... She says, what did I say? And I'm about to tell her and the rest of the House what I said. Just a little patience. 
Uh, it, well, the issue of justice was indeed raised by one of the young people, and that is exactly why, exactly why, within days after the fire, I set up the public inquiry. That, of course, has two phases. It will soon be entering its second phase. We have appointed uh, panel members to sit alongside the judge in that second phase. But the aim of that is to find out exactly what went wrong, who was responsible, who was accountable, and enable that justice for the people of, uh, of Grenfell. And he talks about the, uh, the issue of cladding. Of course, we asked building uh, owners in the pr- private sector to do the action that we believed was necessary, um, but we have seen they have not been acting quickly enough, and that is why we will fully fund the replacement of cladding on high-rise residential buildings, and interim measures are in place where necessary on all 163 high-rise private residential buildings with unsafe ACM cladding. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, obviously the inquiry must go on and we await its response to what actually happened at Grenfell. But the answer she gave is of no comfort to the 60,000 people living in high-rise tower blocks across the country. They are worried. Their communities are worried. And whilst government funding is, of course, necessary and welcome, but not yet available, more than 70 block owners still have no plan in place to get the work done. So will the Prime Minister set an end of this year deadline for all dangerous cladding to be removed and replaced? Will she toughen up the powers for councils to levy big fines and, where necessary, confiscate blocks to get this vital safety work done where the block owners simply fail to do it? Can I say to the right hon. Minister? He knows all affected buildings identified in the social sector have been uh, uh, visited by the Fire and Rescue Services to carry out the checks to make sure the interim safety measures are in place, and remediation work has started on or finished on over three quarters of these buildings, and we are fully funding the removal and replacement of unsafe ACM cladding systems on high-rise social housing. He refers to the housing in the private sector. We asked building owners to take the action that was necessary. We expected building owners to take the action that was necessary. Uh, They have not done enough. They have not acted quickly enough. And that's why the government has stepped in. And the government has said that we will fully fund the replacement of cladding on high-rise residential buildings. And as I said, there are interim measures in place until that work is done. Jeremy Corbyn. The question was, will she ensure this is done by the end of of this year. Under the current current rate of progress, it will take three years for even the social housing blocks to be done. But the issue goes wider. 1,700 other buildings, including hospitals, care homes, schools and hotels, are clad in other potentially combustible materials. If landlords won't act, will the government step in and act on those buildings as well? The 2013 Coroner's Report into the deadly Lacknell House fire recommended sprinklers should be retrofitted to all social housing. Currently, only 32 out of 837 council tower blocks above 30 metres have sprinklers. Two years after Grenfell, six years after the coroner's report, will the Prime Minister now accept the recommendation and set a deadline for all high-rise blocks to have sprinklers retrofitted? First of all, he raises the issue of other cladding, and indeed uh, the work is being done to investigate other cladding and to uh, look at the safety of, uh, of other cladding. Uh, He then talks about the uh, coroner's report and recommendation in 2013. I think he has has inadvertently uh, said something that does not quite reflect what the coroner's report said. What the coroner's report said was that landlords should consider uh, putting in retrofitting sprinklers. It did not say that every building should be retrofitted with with sprinklers. And, of course, as he will know, there are many uh, up and down the country, including Labour councils, who have chosen not to fit sprinklers. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the coroner's report made it very clear that they thought sprinklers would make blocks safer. I don't think we should be playing around with semantics here. We should be making sure... making sure that all the blocks are safe across the whole country. Only 105 of the 673 new-build schools have sprinklers. Under Labour, we would make sure that all new schools have sprinklers fitted. Grenfell survivors say we were victims before the fire. 
Radical change is needed in our system of social housing. Tenants raised concerns about safety. They were ignored. So two years on from Grenfell, when will we see government legislation to strengthen tenants' rights and apply the Freedom of Information Act to all housing associations as well as local authorities? Prime Minister. First of all, it is absolutely right. One of the aspects of what happened at Grenfell Tower, which I believe is truly shocking, is that residents of that tower were raising concerns with the tenant management organisation and the council in a, before the fire happened over a significant period of time, and their voice was not heard. That is why one of the other things that I did after the Grenfell Tower fire was to initiate work looking at social housing for the housing minister, the then housing minister, and this has been taken on by a subsequent housing minister, went around the country meeting with people in social housing to see was this something that happened simply at Grenfell or was this something that was happening across the country and how can we strengthen the voice of people who are living in social housing. That is something that uh, uh, I believe should be done. It is something, it's the work that we have been putting in place. It is absolutely right that the voices of those people should have been heard and should have been acted on, and we want to ensure that in future social housing tenants' voices will be heard. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, that's all well and good, but just how long does it take to amend the Freedom of Information Act to make sure it applies to social housing run by housing associations as well as local authorities? The Government spent £1,013 million on fire services in 2016-17. This year, it's £858 million, a £155 million cut from fire services. Every fire authority across the country, from the 11% cut in Greater Manchester to 42% in Warwickshire, are going through the same experience. Mr Speaker, you can't put a price on people's lives. You can't keep people safe on the cheap. The Prime Minister told the country at the Conservative Party conference last autumn that austerity is over. Will she now pledge that her government will increase fire service funding and firefighter numbers next year? Yes. Prime Minister. To the right honourable gentleman. That indeed we are able to end austerity, we are able to put more money into public services. The reason we're able to do that is because a Conservative government takes a balanced approach to the economy. We have been putting right the wrongs that were left by a Labour government that left us the largest deficit in our peacetime history. That's the legacy of Labour. We saw fewer people in work, less money to spend on public services, and we won't let it happen again. The legacy of this Tory government is 10,000 firefighter jobs cut since 2010, 40 fire stations closed, including 10 in London under the previous mayor. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister claimed action on Grenfell would be part of her legacy, but in two long years, too little has changed. She has met the Grenfell survivors, I have met the Grenfell survivors. Their pain is real, palpable and continues. A big test for the next Prime Minister will be to make good the failings of this Government over the past two years. A failure to rehouse all the survivors, a failure to give justice to the Grenfell community, a failure to make safe on other dangerous high-rise blocks, a failure to retrofit sprinklers, and a failure to end austerity in the fire service. So does the Prime Minister believe that the time of the third anniversary next year, the Government will be able to honestly say to the country, with conviction, to the Grenfell survivors, never again. Yeah. Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Gentleman refers to the rehousing of the Grenfell survivors. All 201 households have been offered temporary or permanent accommodation. Uh, and 100. I think it's 194 of those households have accepted that and 184 have been able to move into their accommodation. The Right Honourable Gentleman talks about the, the, what the Government has been doing in response to the Grenfell Tower fire. We have set up immediately a, a public inquiry. We set up immediately the Dame Judith Hackett review, which looked at the issues around the building regulations and fire safety, and the Government is acting on the results of that, and I expect a future Government to act on the results of the public inquiry. 
I met, I have met, I have met over on a number of occasions now, as I said, including yesterday, people who survived the Grenfell Tower fire, people who lost their homes, people who lost members of their families, young people who lost their best friends. Their pain is indeed great. It will never go away. It is important for us to ensure that we provide the support for those survivors into the future. It isn't just about buildings and cladding. It's about support for the local community. It's about mental health services and support for those who have been affected. This Government is committed to ensuring that we provide that support and to ensuring that we do everything we can to make sure that a tragedy like Grenfell Tower can never happen again. Tim Lawton. Mr Speaker, today is Thank a Teacher Day, and I'm sure the whole House will want to express their gratitude to our hard-working, dedicated uh, teachers. But earlier this week, a report from the DfE showed that children in coastal areas achieve lower grades than elsewhere, which means that children in constituencies like mine have the double whammy, because West Sussex has historically been one of the worst-funded school uh, areas as well. So given the PM recognises that fair funding for schools needs to be a priority in the forthcoming comprehensive spending review. Will she support setting up a coastal schools challenge fund to replicate the success of the London schools challenge fund, which achieves significant improvements in outcomes from 2003 in London? Prime Minister. I say to my honourable friend, first of all, I think we should all recognise Thank a Teacher Day. Uh, I'm sure everybody across this house remembers a particular teacher who had an impact on them, and uh, indeed it helped them to do what it was necessary to become a Member of Parliament and to represent a local community in this House. My honourable friend uh, makes a point about coastal communities. He will know that school funding is at a record level uh, and our reforms have been improving education standards. I want to ensure that schools have the resources they need and reform uh, continues to improve those standards, that we are able to give schools the budgets on a timetable to work for them and that we continue, he mentioned this issue of fairer funding, that we continue to make progress on the fairer national funding formula. I think what my honourable friend has done in referencing a coastal uh, uh, fund for a school, school uh, coastal fund is uh, actually a bid into the spending review that will be coming later in the year. Ian Blackford. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity at the Finsbury Park Mosque. Mr Speaker, this is also World Refugee Week and I want to commend my honourable friend, the member for Nailing and Yar, who brought forward a family reunion bill some time ago. Will the Prime Minister, in the time that she's got left, please make sure that this comes forward to committee? <laughs> Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister agree with the front runner set to succeed her that the Scottish people are a verminous race that should be placed in ghettos and exterminated. Yep. Prime Minister! Can I, can I just say to the right honourable gentleman that the, the Conservative and Unionist Party takes the people of every part of this United Kingdom the contribution from people of every part of this United Kingdom, because that is what makes the United Kingdom the great country it is, and long may Scotland remain part of it. Ian Blackford. Well, of course, Mr Speaker, words matter and actions matter. The man who published those words in his magazine, the Prime Minister thought was fit for the office of our top diplomat, and he hasn't stopped there. He said that Scots should be banned from being Prime Minister. Banned from being Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. And that a pound spent in Croydon was worth more than a pound spent in Strathclyde. This is a man who is not fit for office. It has been said, Mr Speaker, the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. This is a time of challenge, and so I ask does the Prime Minister realise not only is the member racist, he is stoking division in communities and has a record of dishonesty. Does the Prime Minister honestly believe... Oh, order! Uh, order! If the Right Honourable Gentleman is referring to a current member of this House, I don't know whether he is, but if he is, he should... Be extremely careful in the language he uses. He should have notified the member 
in advance. But I would urge him, I would urge him to weigh his words. Mr Ian Blackford. Oh, and indeed, and indeed, and I think it would be much better if for now he would withdraw any allegation of racism or uh, against any particular member. I don't think that this is the forum. I don't think it's the right way to behave. Mr Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, I have informed the member, but the member has called Muslim women letterboxes, described African people as having watermelon smiles and another disgusting slur that I would never dignify by repeating. If that's not racist, Mr Speaker, I don't know what is. Does the Prime Minister honestly believe that this man is fit for the office of Prime Minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. Prime Minister! Can, can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, he's, he's now been leader of the SNP in this chamber for some time. He's been asking Prime Minister's questions for some time. He might actually understand the purpose of Prime Minister's questions, which is to ask the Prime Minister about the actions of the government. That is what he should be asking us about. And I can say to the right honourable gentleman, I can say to the right honourable gentleman that I believe, I believe any Conservative Prime Minister in the future will be better for Scotland than the Scottish Nationalist Party. Nigel Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Prime Minister agree with the importance of tackling? corruption and tax evasion around the world and the key role that knowing who really owns companies plays in that. So would she welcome the announcement today by Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man that they will open their registers in a couple of years' time? Or would she urge our remaining overseas territories to make progress in doing the same? Prime Minister! My, my hon. Friend has raised an important issue. I'm very pleased to see the announcement today from Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. And Indeed, we continue to work with overseas territories to ensure that they do follow those standards and open those, uh, those books so that people can see who is actually owning those companies. Tony or Antony at sea. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following my visit to the Netherlands two weeks ago with Emma Appleby, I've witnessed firsthand the incompetence of both the Home Office and the Department of Health in delivering medical cannabis with THC, not just CBD, for children with severe epilepsy. History was made exactly one year ago today when Alfie Dingley received a licence for his medication when the Prime Minister looked Hannah Deakin, Alfie's mum, in the eye and promised to right this wrong. Yep. Today, will the Prime Minister commit to make it part of her legacy to deliver on her promise, not just to Alfie, but to the many other children that are still suffering? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, lady, obviously, she's absolutely right that we did uh, look at this whole issue of medical cannabis. That's why we changed the approach that was taken. Obviously, individual cases are desperately difficult, and I think everybody across the House feels with the families and friends of those who are affected. But we have ensured that the law has changed, that specialist doctors can now prescribe cannabis-based products for medicinal use, where there is clinical evidence of benefit. I think that is the right thing to do. But I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, has been hearing the testimony of families about the bar barriers they appear to have faced and has asked NHS England to undertake a rapid re-evaluation and address any system barriers to clinically approving prescribing. Scully. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Last year, an Ofsted report uh, reveals severe shortcomings with the London Borough of Sutton's uh, Special Education Needs Department. And I've since met with many parents, such as Hayley Harding, who has to report the resort to tribunals to get an appropriate educational health and care plan for their children. A leaked internal report showed that the money is categorically not the issue, as Sutton has one the, the highest per head spends on send in the whole of the UK, but it also has one of the highest levels of refusals for EHCB assessments. Can the Prime Minister assure me that Sutton Council will receive all possible assistance from the Government to help them resolve their lack of leadership and mismanagement identified in the Council? own report so we don't let families down. Well, my honourable friend has raised a very important issue, and it's vital that all children with special educational needs do receive the support that they need. I've been assured the Council will receive the right support. The DfE and NHS England have been working closely with the local authority to ensure the necessary changes to take place and will continue to do so. But as my honourable friend has said, actually, uh, uh, talked about funding, this year's Sutton's high needs funding has gone up. His allocation has been increased. 
I understand that Ofsted and the CQC will revisit Sutton to ensure the Council is improving its support for children with special educational needs so that those children can indeed fulfil their potential. Diana Johnson. Last month, the Prime Minister wrote to the seven Westminster political leaders and said that the victims of the contaminated blood scandal would have to wait years until the end of the inquiry for compensation to be paid. This is a political decision. Every 96 hours, a victim dies. <laughs> I think the Prime Minister, in her legacy, whilst accepting that she's made the right choice in setting up the inquiry, the, the real legacy would be to pay compensation now, as happened in the Republic of Ireland in the 1990s, for those who've suffered for so much for so long at the hands of the state. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, who has obviously campaigned long and hard on this issue and championed the needs of all those who were affected. Um, it is important, obviously, that victims and their families, uh, they've suffered so much, it's important they get the answers and justice they deserve, and they've been waiting decades for that. In April, as the Honourable Lady will know, the DHS uh, C announced a major up uplift in financial support available to beneficiaries of the infected blood support scheme in England. And there are now discussions underway between officials in uh, the UK, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland administrations to look at a matter of urgency how we can provide greater parity of support across the UK. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party has frequently won the trust of the public over recent uh, generations because of its reputation for economic competence and responsibility. And th th those qualities have helped to contribute to the Prime Minister's legacy, which you leave behind, of recovery from economic crisis to full employment and economic growth. Uh, does the Prime Minister therefore agree with me that in the present uncertainty surrounding Brexit and the change of government, it would be extremely unwise for candidates in the leadership election or for the outgoing government to start making reckless commitments to tax cuts and spending promises which should properly be addressed responsibly in a spending round once the uncertainties are behind us. Prime Minister! First of all, first of all, can I commend my right honourable and learned friend for the work that he did in a previous Conservative administration as Chancellor of the Exchequer. He left a golden economic legacy which was then completely squandered by 13 years of Labour in government. And, as he says, we have had, Conservatives have had to turn that around, and I'm pleased that we see employment at record levels. I'm pleased that we see the deficit down. I'm pleased that we see debt falling. And uh, we are able to ensure that we are, can put more money into public services. We've already committed that biggest ever cash boost in its history for the National Health Service. And I can assure my right honourable friend uh, that in my time as Prime Minister, we will not make any reckless commitments, but we do want to ensure that we see our public services supported as they should be to provide the services that we believe they sh the, the people of this country deserve. Mr. Narendra Sharma. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last nine years, the Prime Minister has held authority over immigration, first as Home Secretary and now as Prime Minister. By her own metric, she has failed to reduce immigration and her unjust, discriminatory, and racist policies have caused thousands of people to be treated inhumanly. In this refugee week and the last weeks of her term in office, can she call her record on immigration anything other than a failure? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that immigration has been good for this country? But what people want to know is that the government can make decisions about who should come to the country, that there is control on the numbers of people coming to the country, and that the government takes action against those who are here illegally. That has been the purpose of the policy that has been pursued since 2010, giving people confidence, confidence in our immigration system, confidence in our immigration system, so that we can ensure that people will well continue to welcome immigrants into this country who give such an important contribution to our life. Nigel Adams. Uh, Mr Speaker, as we build the homes that we, we need across the country, it's essential that we equip 
young people with the correct practical skills to drive forward our economy. Now, the 45th World Skills Competition takes place in Russia this August, and my constituent, 21 year old Lewis Greenwood, will be representing the UK in the bricklaying competition. Will the Prime Minister wish Lewis and the rest of Team UK the best of British in these Skills Olympics? It's absolutely right to uh, reference the fact that we need those skills uh, for, the, uh, for our economy, for our society in the future. And I'm very happy, first of all, to congratulate Lewis on being the UK representative in the bricklaying competition, in that skills uh, competition in Russia, and wish him all the very best. And I'm sure the whole House will wish him all the very best as he carries the UK standard with him. It's always said that Winston Churchill was a 60 bricks an hour man, a very good bricklayer himself, I must advise the House. Did At the end of her career, will the Prime Minister take time to reflect that her creation of the hostile environment led to the Windrush scandal, to a catalogue of errors in immigration decisions, to people feeling unsafe in their own homes, to an atmosphere of distrust and suspicion, and to xenophobia which has damaged our relations with our European neighbours. Will she apologise for that? Prime Minister! Can I first... Can I first of all can I first of all say to the honourable lady because we do mark Windrush Day on June the twenty second, that is a day that has been set up to recognise the contribution that the Windrush generation made to our life, our society and our, our economy here in the UK. Uh, what lay behind the issue in relation to the problems that some members of the Windrush generation have have faced was the fact that when they came into the UK they were not given documentary evidence of their immigration status, and as their countries gained gained independence, they were not given that uh, documentary evidence of their status. That is, it's no good the Honourable Lady shouting rubbish. That That is what lay behind and there were cases of people in the Windrush generation. Order, this is very unseemly behaviour. Members are entitled to ask orderly questions, but having asked the questions, they should then have the courtesy to listen to the Prime Minister's answer. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That is what lay at the heart of the issue in relation to the Windrush generation. And it is the case that there were people in the Windrush generation who faced these difficulties as a result of not having that documentary evidence under both Labour governments in the past and, more recently, under this government. The Home Office is working to put that right, and uh, people who are concerned about this should contact the Home Office Task Force, and they will get the help and support that they need. Andrew Griffiths. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker last week we learned that a 13-year-old boy who brought his rapist to court received £20 in compensation. A 13-year-old girl and a 15-year-old girl received £50 for being abused as children. Will the Prime Minister agree that this is a terrible way to treat the victims of child sexual abuse, that they deserve to be treated fairly and compassionately, and that it sends out all the wrong signals to anybody who is thinking of bringing their perpetrator to uh, justice? Will she agree with me that it takes huge courage to bring a case like that? And will she urgently look at a review of the criminal compensation orders so that victims of child sexual abuse get the justice they deserve? Minister! Can I I say to my honourable friend, I absolutely agree with him that it takes huge huge courage to come forward to talk about uh, incidents of child sexual abuse and to not just to talk about that, but to be able to go through that such that somebody can be brought to justice as the perpetrator of that abuse. And I commend uh, those who he has spoken about specifically, but all those who come forward to do that. And I, I want to ensure, and I hope that from the action this government has taken through setting up the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse uh, and make it very clear that we want these wrongs to be righted. We want people to be able to feel that they can find justice. The memory will never go. Uh, the memory will last, will live with them. But we can at least give them justice. And I urge everybody to come forward 
uh, if they have been subject to child sexual abuse such that justice can be brought. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm dealing with the most traumatic of constituency cases affecting a vulnerable young woman refugee now at risk of prostitution and trafficking here in the UK. She faces being thrown out in the streets by this government who have refused her the support she desperately needs, even though she has a further challenge submitted to the Asylum Support Tribunal. Will the Prime Minister please show her some compassion? The, the Prime Minister raised a very specific case, and obviously I haven't seen the details of that case, but I will ensure that the Home Secretary looks at the details of that case. Gordon Henderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, police officers and firefighters are able to retire at 60. However, prison officers cannot retire until they are 66 and are facing the prospect of having to retire <laughs> at 68. Does my right hon. Friend believe that that is fair? My, Minister. My, my honourable friend has raised an important issue, uh, and uh, obviously this is something that I think has been uh, looked at and considered in the past, but I will make sure that the Ministry of Justice are aware of his concerns. <coughs> Dr Paul Williams. Um, Mr Speaker, my community doesn't feel safe. Crime rates in Stockton South have almost doubled in the last eight years, while Cleveland Police have lost 500 officers. Now her Home Secretary is admitting that we don't have nearly enough police to be able to keep people safe. So does she now think that she might have been wrong to have made such deep cuts to policing? And would she consider, as her final act as Prime Minister, giving Cleveland Police our 500 bobbies back? Prime Minister! We, uh, we have made around £1 billion extra available to these police forces this year. That incre- includes an increase in funding for Cleveland Police. How that money is spent is a matter for the Police and Crime Commissioners and the Chief Constable. We have made funding available and we have ensured that we are giving the police the powers that they need. And, uh, and sadly, the Labour Party in opposition voted against that extra funding for the police. Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, losing a child is every parent's worst nightmare. But up and down the country, every day, parents are caring for children with life-limiting illnesses. For these families, the Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Services are a necessary lifeline. But some of our hospice services are struggling for cash, and indeed Acorns, our largest service, has had to announce the closure of a hospice. Prime Minister, you came to power saying you would help those who are just about managing, but many of these families are barely coping at all. Please, as your legacy, can you give the £40 million needed to provide really good palliative care children's services to all children who need it in this country? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I recognise the important role that hospices play generally, but also children's hospices particularly, and I have been pleased to be involved with the establishment of the Alexander Devine Hospice in my own constituency, uh, which was set up after a family tragically lost their son, Alexander. Um, It is important that we do uh, ensure that people get the support they need as they are seeing a child approaching the end of their life. We have made children's palliative and end-of-life care a priority in the NHS long-term plan, and over the next five years the NHS will be match-funding CCGs who commit to increase their investment in local children's palliative and end-of-life care services by up to seven million, and that's increasing the support uh, up to a total of 25 million a year by 2023-24. These children and their families do deserve the very best care, and I would commend all who are working in the hospice movement because they provide wonderful end-of-life care for children and adults. Mike Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hartlepool Hartlepool is a trial area for universal credit, and now we have seven food banks. Is this a legacy the Prime Minister can be proud of? I say to the uh, Honourable Gentleman, nobody wants to see somebody feeling the need to go to a food bank. But what universal credit, what universal credit does do, what universal credit does do, is ensure that people are helped to get into work, and that work 
pays as they earn more they are able to keep more of that uh, of those earnings and uh, work is the best route out of poverty and universal credit is working to ensure that people get into work and can provide for themselves and their families James Gray uh, Mr Speaker the whole house will I know join the Prime Minister in thanking the emergency services and the armed services when they step up to the mark in times of national or local emergency like the mosque outrage or indeed the Novichok incident in Salisbury near my own constituency but will she also do what she's done throughout her time as Prime Minister and pay tribute to a vast army of other people, the volunteers in our society who do so much for us? I think particularly of the Robbridge Legion, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the Red Cross, and particularly this important day in their life, the Order St John and the St John Ambulance Brigade. These are truly the big society. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Yes, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. So much of what happens in our country, so much that is good in our country, does indeed depend on volunteers up and down the country in the organisations my honourable friend has referenced and in other community groups and other charities too. We should s- celebrate the work that volunteers do, we should commend them for their work and most of all we should say a wholehearted thank you. Yeah. Vicky Foxcroft. Yeah. A high score of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, increases an individual's chances of having physical health issues, poor mental health, or being involved in violence. Today, the Wave Trust will be sending out a survey to anonymously collect MPs' ACEs score. This is the first time this has ever been attempted by any national parliament. So will the Prime Minister, like me, fill in the survey and encourage other colleagues to do the same. The Prime Minister. She raises an important point about the impact that adverse childhood experiences can have on children in their later life. Um, it's one of the reasons why you know, we, are, we are putting uh, so much support and emphasis on mental health of young people to help them uh, uh, as they are going through their life. I, I wasn't aware of this survey. I'm happy to, uh, to look at that survey, and uh, I'm sure all members of the, uh, of the House will look at it and recognise the importance of this information, that this information can... In, uh, increase knowledge of these adverse childhood experiences and help to deal with these issues. David Dukit. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend will be aware that there are already almost 400,000 people employed in the low carbon sector and its supply chains across the country. But can she assure me that more jobs will be created in this industry throughout our modern, through our modern industrial strategy, including in cap- cap- carbon capture, utilisation, and storage, which will be critical to meet our net zero targets? Yep. Yeah. Well, can I say to uh, my honourable friend, uh, absolutely, I can give him the assurance that as we look to meet our climate change target, we will indeed see more jobs being created in this uh, in this sector. And I was very pleased when I made the announcement about the net zero emissions target to visit Imperial College here in London, but. Where where they are doing uh, important research and training work on carbon capture and storage, which will be of benefit across this country and actually across the world as well. Mary Cray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is a dedicated follower of fashion, so can she explain why yesterday her government rejected a penny on every garment sold in this country, which would have created green jobs? a ban on the 300,000 tonnes of textiles that go to landfill or incineration, and the 16 other recommendations made by my committee when she wants to get to a net zero carbon economy by 2050. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, I'm aware of the report from the Environment Audit Committee on this issue. Much that the Committee wants to achieve is actually already covered by government policy. And there are a number of areas I could uh, say. For example, making producers responsible for the full cost of managing and disposing of their products after they're no longer useful. And last week, the Government opened a multi million pound grant scheme to help boost the recycling of textiles and plastic packaging. We have already uh, responded to uh, many of the issues that were raised by that report. Giles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, unlike local councils, NHS bodies are not legally required to balance their budget on an annual basis. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough STP is facing a deficit of £192 million, and other STPs could be raided to bail them out. So what would my right honourable friend say to my constituents including those in places like Jaywick, an area of deprivation and that, that has extensive health inequalities, when they ask me why their services should suffer to meet the deficits of others. 
Can I say to my honourable friend that, of course, we want to ensure that all health uh, uh, trusts, all health services, are indeed operating, operating properly within their budgets and are able to balance their, uh, balance their books. But I, what I would say to uh, his constituents is that I am pleased that this government has been able to increase the funding that is available to the National Health Service, and that will go towards increasing and improving the services that his constituents are able to receive. James. Thank you. Yeah. The Prime Minister is a busy woman. She might not have seen the latest report from Inside Housing. Inside Housing have revealed that three successive ministers were written to over a total of 21 times over four years by the all-party group on fire safety, urging them to act to make sure we avoid another fire following the Lackanal House fire. The last of those 21 letters was written a month before the Grenfell Tower fire. No action was taken. What does the Prime Minister believe those ministers should have done when they received that expert advice? Yeah. Prime Minister! I say, ministers obviously always look very carefully at the expert advice that they receive, but the whole question of what has happened and the advice that was available is a matter that will be looked at in the second phase of the public inquiry. Yeah, yeah. That's pathetic. Maggie through. Yeah. 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 Today in Westminster Hall, members would have the opportunity to debate the independent review of the Modern Slavery Act. Thanks to the leadership of my rightful friend, this landmark piece of legislation has empowered both victims and the police to seek justice, with 239 suspects charged and 185 people convicted of modern slavery offences in 2007-2018. Could my rightful friend outline what further measures she believes would help to strengthen this Act? Well, I'm, I'm pleased that my honourable friend has well, raised this issue because I think this is an important. Uh, it, it remains an important topic. We've seen not only the first convictions under the Act, but also thousands of businesses publishing transparency statements, senior business leaders being much more engaged on the issue than ever before. Um, we'll shortly be published. She asked what more we'll be doing. We will shortly be publishing a consultation to look at ways to strengthen transparency in supply chains, and we're expanding transparency laws to cover the public sector and its purchasing power. This is very important. The public sector has huge purchasing power, and this could be used to good cause to ensure that we are ending modern slavery. Anna Subri. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is keen to secure a legacy of acting in the country's very best interests. So, will she commit to introducing legislation that will guarantee that this House sits in September and in October, so that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, all options are available to this Parliament, including revoking Article 50. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the dates for recess and times for sitting for this House will be uh, uh, published to this House in due course. Run. Um, the national funding formula for schools is great for underfunded constituencies like mine, and funding is going up twice as fast as the national average. But village schools and small schools are still under financial pressure, and their numbers have declined over recent decades. Will my right honourable friend encourage the DfE to look again at how we can make the national funding formula do more to help village schools, which are so important to our rural life? Yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, can I say to my honourable friend that I absolutely ex accept and recognise the important role that village schools play in our rural life. Uh, a lot of work went into the national funding formula. I think it is right that we are introducing this fairer uh, means of, uh, of funding. And we have yet, of course, to reach the end point of the national funding formula. Uh, but I want to see us progressing and ensuring that we are putting that national funding formula uh, in place. But I'm sure that the Secretary of State for Education will have heard the particular request that my honourable friend has made. Dr. Rosanna Allen Khan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am heartbroken, and Tooting is heartbroken. On Friday night, the streets claimed another victim. And Shayon Evans may to this government be another awkward statistic. But to us, he was a son, a brother, a friend taken too soon. This senseless violence could have been avoided with adequate policing, good youth provision, and giving our young people a sense of hope. So my question, Prime Minister, is simple. Will the Prime Minister use her remaining days in office to leave a legacy which will change the paths for these young people, or can we expect yet more of the same? First of all, can I say to the Honourable Lady, none of us ever wants to see a life, or particularly a young life, taken before its time by violent crime. Oh, these are not difficult statistics. They are people 
who had a future ahead of them and who have found them have sadly died and been the result of the violence of criminal perpetrators. We, are, we, have introduced, we have introduced our serious violence strategy. We are working with the police and with other organisations to ensure that young people are turned away from the use of violence, that they are turned away from the use of knives. This is not just a question. She puts it as a question of funding and police numbers. Actually, it's a much wider issue. Anybody who denies that this is a wider issue for our society is simply failing to understand the issue we have to address. And if she wants to talk to somebody about the police on the streets of London, I suggest she talks to the Mayor of London. Dr Julian Lewis! Bearing the subjudice rule firmly in mind, what does the Prime Minister think of the principle of bringing a dying, decorated former soldier before the courts of Northern Ireland on charges based on no new evidence which are unlikely ever to lead to a conviction? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend um, that I know this is an issue that he and a number of other right honourable and honourable friends have raised in terms of individual cases and the general principle. None of us want to see elderly veterans being brought before the courts uh, in the way that he has described. But what we do need to ensure is that we have a processes and systems in Northern Ireland that ensure that proper investigation is taking place. Unfortunately, and I can understand that my colleagues feel that the state has let people like the veteran that he quoted, my honourable friend quoted, down. But the fact is that previous investigations have not been found to be lawful, and that is why we are having to look at the process of investigation. Uh, I have said many times, standing at this dispatch box, I want to ensure that we see the terrorists who cause the vast majority of deaths in Northern Ireland being properly brought to justice. That is what we are working on, and we will continue to work on a system that is fair. Neil Gray. Mr Speaker, um, when the Prime Minister uh, took office as Prime Minister, she suggested that it would be her mission to tackle burning injustices. And yet, this morning, uh, the report from the IFS, commissioned by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, shows that under the cabinets that she has served in over the last nine years, in-work poverty has risen dramatically. Won't that be the legacy of her premiership? Uh, well, he's raised the IFS report. In fact, what the IFS report showed was that uh, people in work are better off. People are better off when they move into work. It showed that under this government, under this government, more people are work than ever before. That material deprivation rates have down, fallen by a fifth since 2010. And it showed, it showed that the reason for the relative poverty figures is that pensioners are better off. The Honourable Gentleman might think cutting pensioners' incomes in the answers is the answer. Actually, I don't. Order. Yes, we'll come to points of order. Mr. Bill Wiggin. I'm most grateful, Mr. Speaker. Since you took the chair, sir, you have been a stalwart defender of backbenchers. You have also stood up to bad parliamentary behaviour, like the use of the word racism. I am deeply upset that your chairmanship has been undermined dramatically because of the very